Grace and peace to you from God, our Father, and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. In my lifetime, I've seen some odd trends and fads pop up, but none have been as legendary or prolific, I think, as subscription services. Good grief, how many subscriptions can we possibly need? I don't know about all of you, but I kind of lose track. I don't know if I can count all of my subscriptions on my hands. Subscriptions have taken over. I mean, don't get me wrong, they've been around for a long time. If you think back, newspapers have been around for a long time, and you could subscribe to these weeklies, bi-weeklies, quarterly, whatever it might be. But I can remember back to when it really took off. Anybody here remember the, the state-of-the-art subscription of DVD-to-door Netflix delivery? Right? I mean, even that now is out the door. DVDs are kind of out the door, forgotten about for our 4K streaming right to the TV, amazing stuff. But the subscription services have only grown since then. I mean, we have so many services for television and movies, and then you tack on your music services, and now we have our food can be delivered right to our door. People can go shopping for us, or we'll have the boxes delivered. And then you tack on to that your health subscriptions and your uh, nutrition subscriptions and apparel and beauty and luxury and everything else. Just out of interest, I Googled subscriptions. You can actually now have scuba gear and snowboard equipment delivered right to your door. Because, you know, Anago is such a big uh, scuba community. If you ever need your, your scuba gear, you can come talk to me. I'll get you hooked up with that subscription service. It's baffling. Baffling how many subscriptions we can have. But you see, I think what's so inviting about subscriptions is that our lives get chaotic. They get busy. They get hectic. But we like to feel like we're in control, have our hands on the wheel. So if we can craft and hone what it is that we need, have it delivered the exact amount of times we want, or those things we think we need in life, have them brought right to our door as we need, as we want to pay for them. It makes us feel like we have authority in our life, right? It makes us feel like we have our hands on the wheel. It's all good to go. But just like most things in this life, there's always another side to that coin. You see, the reason subscription services are so popular for businesses is because they know us. They know we're forgetful. They know that once they get a foot in the door, chances are they're not going anywhere. There's been research done. People are spending hundreds more than they realize a month on subscription services they don't use anymore. Isn't that baffling? We subscribe so quickly because we think we need, and then when we're done with it, it just goes off to collect dust, and we forget about it until maybe we have need for it again, but who knows? Let's take this idea of subscriptions down to the basics for just a second. So subscriptions at their core are us trying to pick and choose what it is that we want or need, right? We have some sort of space we think we have in our life and we want to fill it up. So we pick and choose and then we try and, try and craft that. How often do we want it? How many people are going to be partaking in whatever it might be? How often do we want to pay for it? How often do we want to think about it? Are you starting to see a connection here? See, I'm going to make the argument today that our faith sometimes turns into a subscription. The Bible sometimes turns into the user manual or the catalog. Something we think we can just kind of flip through and pick and choose what it is that we want. The God that we want for that day. So maybe you're having a really tough day, so you pick up your Bible and you flip to all those ones about uh, God forgive, God's forgiveness, and, and that's all you want. Or maybe you're having one of those days where somebody's really getting on your nerves, and you flip over to those ones about God being a judge, and you're thinking, oh, you're going to get it. You just wait. That's the God I want that day. Sometimes it gets even worse. God, you didn't really say that I shouldn't do X, Y, or Z, so I think I'm just going to leave those parts out. Don't you see it? We start, and pick through, we start to pick through this catalog for what it is that we want to subscribe to. And then worship. Worship becomes this obligatory payment. 
the thing we feel like we have to do in order to keep up with our subscription. And don't get me wrong, it's great, but then we start to try and pick our flavor of how it is we want to pay. Maybe, maybe all I need to do is just do a devotion in the morning and that's it. Forget about church. Or maybe I just need to go to one service and forget about our Bible study. Or maybe I just need to listen to my Bible app and I can forget about all the rest of the stuff. Are you starting to see it? We craft and hone what we want, what fits into our life. We try and make scripture into what it, we want it to be, what we want God to be. We start to try and play like we have authority over any of this, and that's the problem. We don't have authority over what this says. We don't have authority over who he is. We need to open up our eyes and our hearts and realize that God's word is to be received because it has authority over us to change us, to work in us. And that's exactly what we're going to see in this gospel reading, that God does have authority. His word has authority. We're in the book of Mark today. And in our gospel reading, Jesus is teaching in a synagogue in Capernaum. It's kind of a, a unique story. It kind of takes some odd turns you don't see coming. But right at the beginning, Jesus goes into the synagogue and he starts teaching. And the reading tells us that uh, all those who heard were just amazed baffled. What is this? What is this that he's teaching? How is he teaching? It's unlike the teachers of the law. What does that mean? In order to help us understand, we need to comprehend who these teachers were. These teachers of the law. For instance, they weren't infallible. They fell to corruption sometimes and sin just like men often do. They taught trivial matters. Remember your Bible readings, you might remember Jesus and his disciples walking and picking grain and they got all upset. He's breaking the laws, working on the Sabbath. You see, they taught about the trivial matters that didn't really make a difference. The things that people had on their hearts, the problems they felt in their hearts and minds. That's not what Jesus came to do. He taught with authority. He taught with authority because he was the word made flesh, the living word. He taught what mattered. He taught about life and death and eternity and all of these important things that people wanted to hear and understand so they might feel comforted in their faith and in who God was. You see, Jesus gets to have authority over these words because he is the living fount of the words. These teachers of the law, they didn't have that kind of authority. Even Martin Luther said that it was almost like these words of authority could have grown arms and legs and walked to the hearer. Jesus has power. When he speaks, creation listens. Of course it was wondrous. Of course it boggled their minds. And you might be thinking, okay, so Jesus' words got authority. This has authority, but, but what's it even got authority to do? What's it get to do just like I did with my children's message? What does that even mean? Well, if we keep reading the story, we get to see exactly what Jesus' authority can do. Amidst this amazement, as people are listening to this wondrous teaching of this man who spoke with authority, another man in the synagogue stood up with an unclean spirit. And he shouts out to Jesus, you know, I know who you are, Holy One, Son of God, all these things. He knew exactly who Jesus was. Finally, Jesus, without a thought, cast him out. Cast the evil spirit out of this individual. And people are further amazed. Can you imagine? Already amazed that everything Jesus had said he could do and all of a sudden this wicked spirit stands up and he simply says be gone and it is gone But it goes even further than that See so take a second to really comprehend what is going on here We have no idea who this man is or what his life looked like And when he stood up he didn't stand up and say please Jesus cast this spirit that is afflicting me out he didn't beg for forgiveness or healing or anything else. Maybe he couldn't even 
uh, form those words on his lips. Maybe we could argue that his subscription had lapsed. Maybe, you know, he didn't have any right to call out to the creator of the world. As we really don't have much right alone in our sinfulness and brokenness. But what's incredible is that even though Jesus could have simply turned his back, could have simply said, you know what, go away, I'm teaching, he cast the wickedness out. Friends, this authority is the authority to move the darkness, to burn it away. It's the ability to create life, the world, you and me. It is the authority to reign over all things each and every day. Sure, you might not be afflicted by a wicked spirit. You might not stand up and shout. At least I, I hope nobody stands up and shouts at me. But we do have darkness in this world. The tempter is always active, calling out to us, trying to lead us astray. We're imperfect people. I'd even argue that it's that imperfection that is calling out to us, saying, sure, don't worry about it. Faith is a subscription. Make God whoever you want him to be. It doesn't really matter. But it's that voice that Jesus came to burn away, to destroy, to cast out so he could make room for the Holy Spirit to work and change in our lives, to have authority. You see, the good news is that this God who comes in the flesh to work, to live, to die, to teach, to show his authority, to save. This man that he cast the spirit out of all those who are hearing, everybody that was, is, and ever would be, Jesus came to save with his authority over everything. Fellow believers, Jesus has authority over everything. He teaches from within because he is the living word, made flesh, who came to live, die, rise again, blow the entrance off the tomb, make sure the grave had no power over us. Jesus' words hold power and authority over you and me, over the world, over good and evil, everything. His perfect life had the authority to cover our sins each and every day. His power and reign has the authority to guide us, to renew us, to strengthen us, to love us. Dear friends, our faith should be more than a subscription. It's not something that we get to have authority and power over, molding and sculpting, changing into what we want it to be. It's the other way around. Scripture and God have the authority over us to change us into what we're supposed to be. Don't you see it? In the waters of baptism, he changes us. In Scripture, he tells us who we should be as his children. When you allow God to be in the control of the wheel, when you understand his authority is the authority, it gives you the chance to open your eyes instead of looking down at your feet trying to hone the kingdom you want to try and make to look out into this world that he has already made to see that you have a place in it. That you are wanted and redeemed and loved and sent forth with little pieces of his authority to be his stewards, another Christian word, to help take care of this creation. I'm telling you here and now, let go of the control. Let go of the control over the God who has the authority over everything. Be freed up to live as he wants you to live, to serve as he wants you to serve, to be unburdened by your sins and the brokenness. Because when we do that, we realize that we too are lights in this world. Disciples of the one true God. The only individual who has authority over everything, known and unknown. As I said at the beginning of the service, for those of you who don't know, it, it's the National Lutheran Schools Week. And this year, our, our theme verse is from John 15, and it says this, I am the vine, and you are the branches. If you remain in me, and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. 
Our students have been learning what it is to be connected to God, what it means to bear good fruit. But this week, with it being a special week, we took that just a little bit further. And further down in John 15, Jesus says, You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit. Dear friends, you're not subscribed to this faith. You didn't get to pick it. You didn't choose Christ. He chose you. He ascribed, ascribed, put his word into you, changed you, molded you, paid for you. The good news is that you are so wanted that you didn't have to come to the cross and try and figure all of this out. No, he brought it to you so that you might be changed and believe everything that he has done. And this thing that he commands unto you after choosing you isn't to work your life away, it's to simply love. That good fruit, it's to love one another as you have been loved. Let that rest upon your heart. His word has changed you. His reign protects and strengthens you. His love is sufficient for you day in and day out. Stop trying to subscribe and change him. Open your heart and allow it to work within you so that you can go forth in this life in love as you have been loved and set free each and every day. Let's pray. Dear God, we give you thanks that you do have authority in this life over everything, burning away the darkness and wickedness, breaking open the tomb, setting us free from death, sin, and the devil. Help us to live a life of faith in the knowledge and comfort that you are there, having bought and redeemed us. Help us to love as you have loved, and help us to give over control unto you, the ultimate authority in this life and the next. Amen.